You're listening to the Philosopher's Note on how to stop worrying and start living. More wisdom in less time. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome to the Philosopher's Notes on how to stop worrying and start living. Time-Tested Methods for Conquering Worry by Dale Carnegie. We'll start with the quote, No one living has enough emotion and vigor to fight the inevitable and, at the same time, enough left over to create a new life. Choose one or the other. You can either bend with the inevitable sleet storms of life, or you can resist them and break. Again, that's Dale Carnegie from How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. So Dale Carnegie rocks, in my opinion. If you've read How to Win Friends and Influence People, you've been exposed to his laid-back, tell-it-like-it-is style. Same with this book. So if you've got a little more worry in your life than you'd like, and who doesn't, huh? Then I think you'll really love this book and note. It's packed with goodness, and I'm excited to jump right in, so let's. First big idea is what worry may do to you. Quote, 70% of all patients who come to physicians could cure themselves if they got rid of their fears and worries. End quote. It's a pretty powerful stat, huh? So why should you care about stopping your worry habit? Well, in addition to the fact that being a worrier makes you a bummer to be around, sorry to break that to you, you're destroying your health, reducing your energy today, and trimming years, if not decades, off your life. Carnegie quotes a Dr. Montague who says, You do not get stomach ulcers from what you eat. You get ulcers from what is eating you. And a Dr. Alexis Carroll who says, Those who do not know how to fight worry die young. Then he quotes some philosopher guy named Plato who says, The greatest mistake physicians make is that they attempt to cure the body without attempting to cure the mind. Yet the mind and the body are one and should not be treated separately. All right, so you don't need any more convincing on the why, right? Time for the how to stop worrying. Here's the next big idea. Live in day-tight compartments. Quote, so let's be content to live the only time we can possibly live, from now until bedtime. Anyone can carry his burden, however hard, from now until nightfall, wrote Robert Louis Stevenson. Anyone can do his work, however hard, for one day. Anyone can live sweetly, patiently, lovingly, purely, till the sun goes down. And this is all that life really means, end quote. So that's chapter one in a nutshell. Live in daytight compartments. Carnegie's a bit of a quote machine like me and goes from Jesus to Montaigne and Dante to Carlyle. Jesus says, have no anxiety for the tomorrow. Montaigne says, my life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. Dante says, think that this day will never dawn again. And Carlyle, our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. And Horace says, Happy the man, and happy he alone, he who can call today his own, he who, secure within, can say, Tomorrow do thy worst, for I have lived today. So again, the big idea is, quote, Shut the iron doors on the past and the future. Live in daytight compartments. And ask yourself these questions. These are all from Dale Carnegie. He says, quote, Number one, do I tend to put off living in the present in order to worry about the future or to yearn for some magical rose garden over the horizon? Two, do I sometimes embitter the present by regretting things that happened in the past that are over and done with? Three, do I get up in the morning determined to seize the day, to get the utmost out of these 24 hours? Four, can I get more out of life by living in daytight compartments? And five, when shall I start to do this? Next week? Tomorrow? Today? End quote. So those are great questions to reflect on 
as you ponder how to stop worrying and start living. You might want to rewind that and listen to them again and do some journaling and thinking on them. Um, And by the way, the answer to number five is today. (laughs) Now is always a good time to start taking the action you know is consistent with your highest self. All right, back to the big ideas. The next one is be willing to have it so. Quote, Professor William James, the father of applied psychology, has been dead since 1910. But if he were alive today and could hear this formula for facing the worst, he would heartily approve of it. How do I know that? Because he told his own students, quote, be willing to have it so. Be willing to have it so, he said, because acceptance of what has happened is the first step in overcoming the consequences of any misfortune, end quote. So have you read Loving What Is by Byron Katie? It's a brilliant book, and I think you'll love the notes on them if you haven't read them yet. The basic idea is uh, this. She says, quote, I realized that it's insane to oppose it. When I argue with reality, I lose, but only 100% of the time. <laughs> I love that. And she also says, if you want reality to be different than what it is, you might as well try to teach a cat to bark. That's genius. All right, so you want to stop worrying and start living? Well, quit arguing with reality. Or in the words of William James, be willing to have it so. Arguing with reality is one of the absolute best ways to ruin your life. As Deepak Chopra says in his great book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, and I have notes on those as well. He says, quote, This means that your acceptance of this moment is total and complete. You accept things as they are, not as you wish they were in this moment. This is important to understand. You can wish for things in the future to be different, but in this moment, you have to accept things as they are. End quote. Of course, in challenging times, we want a better future whether that's five seconds from now or five days or weeks or years, but we must accept what is. From that place, the tension melts, the worry evaporates, and we connect to source and have all the strength we need to embrace the moment and take the next constructive step toward creating our ideal lives. And the best part? We can enjoy this moment, no matter how challenging it is. As Marcus Aurelius says in his classic meditations, again, you can see the notes on that, quote, So here is a rule to remember in the future. When anything tempts you to feel bitter, not this is a misfortune, but to bear this worthily is a good fortune. End quote. Next big idea, decide and rock it. Quote, experience has proved to me time after time the enormous value of arriving at a decision. It is the failure to arrive at a fixed purpose, the inability to stop going around and round in maddening circles that drives men to nervous breakdowns and living hells. I find that 50% of my worries vanishes once I arrive at a clear, definite decision. And another 40% usually vanishes once I start to carry out that decision. So, I banish about 90% of my worries by taking these four steps. 1. Writing down precisely what I'm worried about. 2. Writing down what I can do about it. 3. Deciding what to do. And 4. Starting immediately to carry out that decision. End quote. I give that an amen. So, uh, in the note here, I have some little space I've created where you can journal. I would suggest you think about these four questions if you're stressed about something. Number one, what's stressing you out right now? Write down, I am stressed out about, and write it down. Or think about it if you're driving or running or juicing or whatever. Number two, what can you do? I can do this about what's stressing me out. Think about that. What can you do about what's stressing you out? Number three, what will you do? I will do this. I'll take this action in order to deal with what's stressing me out. And number four, very good. Now do it. Take action now. Don't wait. That's where the worry comes in. Take action now. So again, one, write down precisely what you're worried about. Write down what you can do about it decide what you're going to do and start immediately to carry out that decision. 
really cool stuff on how to stop worrying and start living. All right. The next big idea is don't cry over spilt milk. This is a long quote from Dale Carnegie. I'm going to share it because it it so perfectly captures my uh, ethos here with the philosopher's notes. He says, quote, some readers are going to snort at the idea of making so much over a hackneyed proverb like don't cry over spilt milk. I know it is trite, commonplace, a platitude. I know you have heard it a thousand times. But I also know that these hackneyed proverbs contain the very essence of the distilled wisdom of all ages. They have come out of the fiery experience of the human race and have been handed down through countless generations. If you were to read everything that has ever been written about worry by the great scholars of all time, you would never read anything more basic or more profound than such hackneyed proverbs as don't cross your bridges until you come to them and don't cry over spilt milk. If we only applied those two proverbs instead of snorting at them, we wouldn't need this book at all. In fact, if we applied most of the old proverbs, we would lead almost perfect lives. However, knowledge isn't power until it is applied. And the purpose of this book is to remind you of what you already know and to kick you in the shins and inspire you to do something about applying it. That is genius. We all seem to want the fancy new techniques or the check me out, I'm really smart intellectual philosophies. But I love the good old fashioned obvious truths. And I equally love the way Carnegie puts it here. Quote, knowledge isn't power until it is applied. And the purpose of this book is to remind you of what you already know and to kick you in the shins and inspire you to do something about applying it. End quote. That seriously sums up pretty much my intention with these notes. Move my foot up from a kick in your shins to a kick in your butt, and I think we're there. (laughs) So two things. Number one, specifically about worry. What spilt milk are you worrying over? What in your past are you still ruminating about, complaining about, losing sleep over, etc.? The relationship, the family argument, the job, the missed opportunity, the whatever. When exactly do you plan to move on? Now might be a very good time for that. And uh, the second thing, what piece of wisdom do you know to be true, but for whatever reason you have yet to embody? Remember, knowledge is not power until it's applied. So what's the knowledge you need to apply? And when do you plan to apply it? Again, now is always good. So again, in this note, I have a little area for you to journal because this is so important. Knowledge I know, but I've yet to apply. And I've got a few lines here. So think about that if you're not in front of your uh, piece of paper. Knowledge that you know, but for whatever reason you have yet to apply. What is that for you? All right. And when will you start to apply this knowledge? I actually filled that answer in for you here in the note. The answer is, of course, now. All right. The next big idea, rest before you get tired. Quote, so to prevent fatigue and worry, the first rule is rest often. Rest before you get tired. Carnegie gives us a chapter full of the benefits of using relaxation as a means to reduce worry. And the fact that preventing fatigue is a huge step toward preventing worry. He starts by making the point that it's impossible to be totally relaxed and worried at the same time. Impossible. That alone is enough advice to solve most of our worry. So if you're stressed, relax, totally relax. The point is simple. You can prevent worry by preventing fatigue. How do you do that? A lot of different ways. But the smartest is to rest before you get tired. Carnegie cites the U.S. Army, your heart, Winston Churchill, Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, and many others to prove his point. The U.S. Army rests its soldiers 10 minutes out of every hour they march before they get tired and their overall efficiency goes straight up. Churchill? He worked 16 hours a day in his late 60s and early 70s during World War II. His secret? He worked from bed a lot, took naps, and rested frequently. How about Rockefeller, who lived to 96? He took a half-hour nap every noon. They say the president couldn't call at that time and wake him up. His nap was absolutely a ritual he didn't miss. Edison attributed his enormous energy and endurance to his habit of sleeping 
whenever he wanted to. And how about the coolest example, perhaps, your heart. As Carnegie says, quote, your heart pumps enough blood through your body every day to fill a railway tank car. It exerts enough energy from every 24 hours to shovel 20 tons of coal onto a platform three feet high. It does this incredible amount of work for 50, 70, or maybe 90 years. How can it stand it? Dr. Walter B. Cannon of the Harvard Medical School explained it. He said, quote, most people have the idea that the heart is working all the time. As a matter of fact, there is a definite rest period after each contraction. When beating at a moderate rate of 70 pulses per minute, the heart is actually working only 9 hours out of the 24. In the aggregate, it rests for a total of 15 hours per day. End quote. Isn't that amazing? So how about you? Are you taking enough rest? If you're worried, check in and see if you're also fatigued. And then know that it's impossible to be totally relaxed and worried. So get relaxed. And when I was writing this note, I said, Speaking of which, it's time for my 9.30 a.m. meditation. Seriously, I'll be right back. It's funny because it's actually 9.30 a.m. right now. I'm going to finish this note and then do my meditation. All right, so more on fatigue. Quote, Psychiatrists declare that most of our fatigue derives from our mental and emotional attitudes. What kinds of emotional factors tire the sedentary or sitting worker? Is it joy, contentment? No, never. It's boredom, resentment, a feeling of not being appreciated, a feeling of futility, hurry, anxiety, worry. Those are the emotional factors that tend to exhaust the sitting worker, make him susceptible to colds, reduce his output, and send him home with a nervous headache. Yes, we get tired because our emotions produce nervous tensions in the body. End quote. Moving on to the next big idea. So the answer to fatigue. Quote, what is the answer to this fatigue? Relax, relax, relax. Learn to relax while you are doing your work. End quote. All right, so how about some how-tos on relaxing? We've got four of them here. One, relax in odd moments. Let your body go limp like an old sock. That's how Carnegie puts it. And Carnegie says he keeps an old maroon dress sock on his desk to remind himself to relax. (laughs) I love that image. Number two, quote, work as much as possible in a comfortable position, end quote. So 10 years ago, when I was a stressed out 25-year-old CEO with 45 employees who'd raised $5 million to finance my first business, eteams.com, during the dot-com boom of the late 90s, I used to get what I'd call Frankensteined. (laughs) My neck wouldn't move because it was so tight. And I realized that all the tension was adding up and was exacerbated by the fact that I had my computer monitor set up so I had to look to my right while typing. Not comfortable. In fact, it was pretty dumb. So do you look straight at your computer monitor? If not, please fix that today. Seriously. Get comfy and relax while you work. All right, number three, quote, check yourself four or five times a day and say to yourself, am I making my work harder than it actually is? Am I using muscles that have nothing to do with the work I'm doing? I love that. I often set up my stopwatch's timer to repeatedly count down from 30 minutes. When it beeps, It's a brilliant reminder for me to pause, stretch out quickly, shut my eyes, breathe deeply, relax, say a few mantras, and do a quick recharge. You might dig that. It's amazing to see just how much tension we can build, even doing stuff we love. So why not set your stopwatch to count down from 30 minutes or 2 hours, whatever works for you, and try that out. Remember to relax regularly throughout the day. And number four, quote, Test yourself again at the end of the day by asking yourself, just how tired am I? If I'm tired, it is not because of mental work I have done, but because of the way I have done it. So know that if you're cranky, that's the end quote, know that if you're cranky or tired, it's because of the tension you allowed to build up during the day. Relax. Breathe. Crumple yourself up like an old sock and keep the fatigue and worry away. 
The next big idea, we've got two more here. The next big idea is other people aren't thinking about you. Quote, I realize now that people are not thinking about you and me or caring what is said about us. They are thinking about themselves before breakfast, after breakfast, and right on until 10 minutes past midnight. They would be a thousand times more concerned about a slight headache of their own than they would about the news of your death or mine. End quote. That's awesome and so true. Tim Ferriss in his great book, The 4-Hour Workweek, says something along the lines of, quote, don't worry about what other people think. They don't think that often anyway. <laughs> Pretty funny. The fact is, most people rarely think, and when they do, it's almost certain to be worrying about what you think about them than about something going on with you. So a key way to stop worrying and start living is, Get totally independent of the good or bad opinion of others. And the final big idea is get busy. Quote, George Bernard Shaw was right. He summed it all up when he said, The secret of being miserable is to have the leisure to bother about whether you are happy or not. End quote. This is still Carnegie. He says, So don't bother to think about it. Spit on your hands and get busy. Your blood will start circulating. Your mind will start ticking, and pretty soon this whole positive upsurge of life in your body will drive worry from your mind. Get busy. Keep busy. It's the cheapest kind of medicine there is on this earth, and one of the best. End quote. That is classic. So are you giving yourself the leisure time to be miserable? Well, spit on your hands and get to work on something constructive already, will you? Of course, we need time to reflect and envision our ideal lives, but be careful lest you spend too much of that time in anxiety. If you find yourself worrying, go back up there to the four-step worry-busting formula, or rewind in this case, and rock number four. That was the just do it part. And stop worrying and start living. All right, well, that's the note. I'm now going to give you a quick blurb on Dale Carnegie, the author of How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And then I'm going to read the quotes from the sidebar, and uh, you'll be set. So Dale Carnegie was born in 1888 and lived until 1955. He described himself as a simple country boy from Missouri, but was also a pioneer of the self-improvement genre. Since the 1936 publication of his first book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, he's touched millions of readers, and his classic works continue to impact lives to this day. So here's some quotes. You've heard this one before. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And a couple from Dale Carnegie who says, Let me repeat, do what the army does. Take frequent rests. Do what your heart does. Rest before you get tired, and you will add one hour a day to your waking life. And another from Carnegie, I know with conviction beyond all doubt that the biggest problem you and I have to deal with, in fact almost the only problem we have to deal with, is choosing the right thoughts. If we can do that, we will be on the high road to solving our problems. How about Confucius? Confucius says, To be wronged or robbed is nothing unless you continue to remember it. Henry David Thoreau says, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by conscious endeavor. If one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams— and endeavors to live the life he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Love that quote. Disraeli says, Life is too short to be little. William James says, The sovereign voluntary path to cheerfulness, if your cheerfulness be lost, is to sit up cheerfully and to act and speak as if cheerfulness were already there. Carnegie says, De minimis non curat lex, or something to that effect. The law does not concern itself with trifles, and neither should the worrier if he wants peace of mind. Albert Hubbard says, Every man is a damn fool for at least five minutes every day. Wisdom consists in not exceeding that limit. 
Milton says, The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Carnegie says, Epictetus, the great Stoic philosopher, warned that we ought to be more concerned about removing wrong thoughts from the mind than about removing tumors and abscesses from the body. Carnegie says, I spent 12 years working with cattle, yet I never saw a Jersey cow running a temperature because the pasture was burning from lack of rain, or because of sleet and cold, or because her boyfriend was paying too much attention to another heifer. The animals confront night storms and hunger calmly, so they never have nervous breakdowns or stomach ulcers, and they never go insane. And finally, Carnegie says, Obviously, circumstances alone do not make us happy or unhappy. It is the way we react to circumstances that determines our feelings. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is within you. That is where the kingdom of hell is, too. So there you go. We have the uh, big ideas, a little bit about Dale Carnegie and the quotes. And that wraps up our note on How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. Hope you enjoyed and uh, trust you're doing great. Looking forward to sharing more with you soon. Have an awesome day. We hope you enjoyed this Philosopher's Note. Please go to www.philosophersnotes.com to download more.